All right. Hello, everyone. Come on in. I'm just finishing setting up real quick. Hello, hello. I need a tripod or something for the fish can. If I have it angled low, then you get the glare of the uh, reflection from the screens. And that's no fun. So I have to set up a special box for it every time. Yep, the fish, the fish was able to stay warm this week. We did not lose power, thankfully. Um, and uh, everything was pretty much good. Um, in, in lieu of uh, actually unpacking boxes and dusting off the shelves and things, I put a, a plant above my, uh, my right shoulder. <laughs> so that looks slight improvement for the uh, class display here. All right, so hopefully most everybody is in or is arriving now. So I want to take care of a few um, kind of housekeeping things for the class. Um, first of all, we did have our exam. I, I do plan to um, actually take a, a Kahoot um, just to see kind of how you guys felt about the about the exam, and I still need to pull that up as as I. Um, talk here for a moment. Um, so we'll get to, we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, but so the we have the exam. I have not started grading the exam, but I did grade homeworks one and two. I've posted those now so you should be able to see the homework one and two grades, kind of the, the final grade form out of 100 instead of the weird um, weird form that was in before. I, I realized that one of the things that I had done by mistake in Moodle was I had put the, um, I'd set Moodle to grade based on a confidence-based metric system, which I did not intend to do. Um, and so it prompted you to select how confident in your answers you were, and that was just kind of silly and provided, I think that's part of why we got negative numbers and just weird results. So anyway, I cleaned that up and that should be good to go. Um, I don't know if I set the exam that way or not. Hopefully not. At any rate, I will be working on the exam. I'm going to grade at least several of them before we go through the solutions. And I plan to go through those with you on Thursday. So that's, um, that's my plan at the moment. I hope you all were able to stay warm. Um, Last week was a little weird, and uh, given that we had Thursday off, um, LSU decided to go ahead and remove our planned March break, so March 25th. And the only thing that I changed based on the, uh, the March break changing, and I'll answer your question in just a moment. Um, essentially, we had the Flint water crisis lecture, seminar, um, lined up for the before exam two. Um, so all I did was I moved that um, to behind exam two. That's really the only change in the syllabus. So it really shouldn't affect you at all. Uh, it's material that I'm not directly covering on exam two. It's related to that material, but it's not, um, it's not like you're learning new formulas or anything like that. So um, in that regard, it hopefully won't, won't really be affecting you. Um, for the participation points, right now we just have two scores. That's the, uh, the first feedback Moodle that I provided. Um, you guys gave me some feedback. Um, and that was, I think, in the second or third week that I did that. And then uh, one other quiz that we've done that covered most of the most of the material before exam one, just kind of a topical stuff. So that's, there's only two grades there for now. Um, and that's kind of an average of those two scores. And those scores were, for the first one, it was pretty much three points if you participated. The second one was, if you participated, you got, I think, 70% of the score automatically. And then 
um, the remaining 30% of the, the points you were earning based on your performance on the quiz. Um, so that's how it's broken up right now. I plan to give you more quizzes, participation opportunities as we go forward. And if I feel like it's not really providing a decent picture of your actual participation in the class, which is just weird this semester, you know, the, the setup, then I will, I will adjust it. Um, I reserve the right to be more generous, let's say. So that's, um, that's the other possibility. But please, if, you, if I am posting quizzes, make sure you're doing those. Um, with that in mind, and with your feedback from a few weeks ago, I, I saw that you guys really did like the, um, uh, essentially the, um, the Kahoot quizzes and things. So one of the things I wanted to go ahead and do was play a Kahoot with you for whoever's on. Now this is, um, let's see, Kahoot changed a few things. I'm pulling it up now. Um, okay, so it should work. Uh, now, they changed a few things, so I can't really do surveys the way I used to, and there's a, a small, there's a question at the end that's I can't really edit right now. It's about seeing the um, pilot filtration plant. Um, but go ahead and join this Kahoot. Um, give me some feedback. You can use whatever username you want just as long as it is uh, professional, we'll say. Um, it can be silly professional, but it, it should be should be in mind that you are in a professional environment right now. Okay, so this is just gonna be, this This does not count towards any grade. I'm just doing this to, to have a little bit of live feedback, see how you guys are doing. Um, with regards to the exam um, for whoever's here. So it, because I, I don't want to limit participation to in class, given the sometimes we might have to do asynchronous, I'm just going to, um, I'm going to keep the graded portions to the, the Moodle quizzes. Okay, so I see at least 30 viewers in the stream and 22 of you joined here. So um, definitely please join up. I do appreciate the, um, the ability to see how well the stormtroopers did on the, uh, on the exam or how they felt about it. Hopefully they were uh, a little more accurate than the stormtroopers, right? All right. Okay. So if anybody else is welcome to join as we go. Um, Copy that so I have that in case you need it. All right, do we have sound? Yeah, there's, there's a little bit of sound. Okay, how did you feel about the exam's length? Um, and obviously, this is with um, given the situation, you got five seconds, by the way, so punch an answer. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's really short. Okay. All right, and don't worry, I've selected one just randomly as the correct answer, but again, there's no grades, no, no matter here. Okay, so long but manageable, a little bit, a few of you too long, um, a reasonable amount that were just about right. Okay, I'm, I'm glad to see that. Um, I'm not, you know, especially with the online delivery, I'm never quite sure uh, how to think about it, um, but that's good to know. Thank you. So how well prepared did you feel? If anybody wants to join, um, I'm going to turn off my camera so that anybody else joining can see the uh, Kahoot ID here. All right, sweet, two of you aced it, great. Um, and 
after that, a lot of you felt mostly prepared. A few of you thought you were, but then it didn't seem to help. And then um, one of you wished you had prepared better. And this is a sample of probably a quarter of the class, um, given the numbers. So, but if the rest of the class has a similar distribution, then that's that's good to see. Okay, how about the difficulty? What did you think? Okay, um, a few that felt that it was too difficult and complex. Most of you felt like it was challenging but manageable, and then a few of you realized that as soon as you finished the problem, then you remembered how to do it, which is painful, but is an unfortunate part of test taking and examinations. I'm, I'm glad to see most of you felt like it was challenging but manageable, because especially with the you know take home online delivery, that is what I'm aiming for, because I don't want anybody to have an opportunity to look up these answers and cheat or anything like that. So um, that, so I'm, of course, I don't want people to feel like it's too, too difficult or too complex, but I understand that does happen sometimes. Um, okay. Uh, don't worry about this one. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, just to answer, I guess, true if you are interested in learning about the um, pilot scale granular filtration. We're going to talk about granular filtration today. Um, I've got a granular filtration pilot scale thing in my lab. Um, I think I'll show some pictures of it today. So if you want to know more about it, just hit the true button. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it a bit and, um, you know, we can talk in the chat about it a little further if you'd like. All right. Cool. Come back to that. All right, thank you. Um, so with that, we will get into today's class, today's lecture topic. So today we're going to talk about filtration. And generally this, this section, you know, material for exam two will include filtration, both membrane and what we call granular. And it will include um, disinfection. So three treatment processes here that go a little bit beyond the basic gravity separations, right? For, for the previous, um, for exam one, we really covered the basics of reactors and mass balances to get you on kind of the same page, uh, chemistry, all of that as a refresher and a foundation for the rest of the course. Then we covered perhaps the simplest um, treatment concept, which was sedimentation using gravity. And now we're going to look at membrane and granular filtration. Um, certainly we can employ gravity here, um, but to, as a, a source for the pressure or driving force for water to go across our, fil our filters, um, but it's not, you know, it's not gravity that's uh, at work per se. Okay, so what's the difference? First, I'll say, um, membrane filtration on the right here, you can imagine a membrane as something that's excluding particles or objects by its size. So if you have particle in water and it's flowing through this mesh, particle gets stuck on the surface. You can imagine this just like a window screen or a screen porch where you don't want the mosquitoes to come in, but you want to be able to feel the air, smell the, the flowers outside and and hear the sounds, whatever else. You want um, that screen to block some stuff, but not everything. You can consider that a membrane. It's acting primarily on a size exclusion basis. We're gonna come back and talk about membranes next time, but for now, what we're gonna do is actually take a look at what we call granular filters, where we have some media, uh, a bed of media, and this is going to be um, typically some sort of granular media, um, sand, 
uh, activated carbon grain, granules or some other minerals. And it's just gonna be a bed packed with those. Um, then you're gonna have water loaded up on top of it. And the water is gonna then flow through. So we're gonna add water in, and then the water will go through the media and essentially have some filtration. Um, a good example of this is actually my aquarium. Um, now this is gonna be a little different than your typical granular media because we have pebbles over here that are much larger. You know, if I were to put sand in with the pebbles, um, it would be closer to what we'd use for water treatment. But actually what you'll find is a lot of the treatment goals are similar, um, if not the same. So I'm gonna move this camera um, and give you a, a little better of a picture here. So if we take a look at all those pebbles there, essentially what's happening is the, uh, the fish is happy because the water is flowing up through those pebbles, or excuse me, down through those pebbles, because the, the air bubblers are actually pulling air, uh, pulling water, because the bubbles are going upwards, it's pulling a current up through those tubes. Those tubes are connected down into a grid underneath, um, underneath all the pebbles. Then essentially what happens is we get a net flow coming through. Yeah, uh, the fish is not camera shy today, thankfully. Um, we get a net flow coming up uh, of water up through those tubes, and that's pulling the water down through uh, that granular media. So that's um, kind of a, a an in-home example uh, of water of this process in action. Now, in this case, a big part of what's going on is actually the biological stuff. Um, I'll come back and mention that in a few minutes um, regarding the history of uh, granular filtration. Um, but essentially what's happening here, especially when we have all the sand at play, is as particles are moving through in the, in the water, there's lots and lots of opportunities for the particles to absorb onto the sides, the edges, the, the um, nooks and crannies of the granular media, of the pebbles, of the sand, um, or to just simply impact them and stick. Um, and the filtration is actually not so much size exclusion as it is uh, allowing sedimentation, maybe helping particles coagulate with each other and then they're too large to move through um, and to just make use of all these different processes of particles that are hopefully destabilized. So sometimes we use this instead of sedimentation. So we, if we destabilize the particles and then send them through sand, they'll stick to the sand and whatever other grains um, pretty rapidly. So we can use this as a substitute or in addition to sedimentation. An exa another example for kind of an in-house type of a, a granular filter would be a Brita filter. Now this incorporates um, the activated carbon as well, which is a slightly different process that's, um, and in fact, I have activated carbon um, in the little canisters in, um, in the fish tank as well. So uh, if you see the little things up here that the air is bubbling through, that's actually activated carbon. We'll show you here. Um, so you can buy this stuff from an aquarium store. It's activated carbon. Um, and the purpose here is this can um, essentially collect lots of chemicals um, in addition to particles and it kind of helps clean the water. So I'm going to put a little bit in my hand just to kind of show you, hopefully this will not be too messy. So you can kind of see they are granular. Might even be able to hear that. And it's just um, essentially that's the type of stuff that's in your Brita filter. And so if you are using a new Brita filter or other, you know, in-home water filter to purify your tap water, this can, this will probably react with the chlorine and take the chlorine out of your, 
um, out of your system and it will probably uh, taste a little better, remove random chemicals. Um, chances are the water is already plenty safe and good to, to drink, but it's just as that added layer for kind of comfort and aesthetics. Um, the other thing about the activated carbon is with a new filter, you pour some water through it and you might get these black specks. Um, that's essentially because some of the, the particles are still kind of loose. Um, they should pretty much be safe, but usually you flush it um, for a little while first. Uh, and we're going to talk about um, that process on a uh, municipal or full, full uh, treatment scale in terms of how to account for, um, for things just like that. Okay. So how does it work? Well, several mechanisms here, and I already kind of mentioned them. Uh, the first thing that can happen is mechanical screening can occur for large particles. So if a particle is large enough, it can be screened out simply because it doesn't fit between, <clears throat> it doesn't fit between the grains of sand or um, media. That's not what we rely on typically, because usually we're targeting smaller stuff. If we had that large of items that we needed to take care of, um, maybe a membrane or even sedimentation might just be easier. Um, but certainly that can happen. Um, more likely, it's going to be one of the other processes where sedimentation can occur. We have a small little particle. It's falling anyway. And as it moves through the pores, maybe it's traveling and it encounters a space where it has to travel this way. Well, during that time, it still has that sedimentation velocity downwards. And so it can sediment and just contact, you know, right here on the, on the surface and be removed that way. So while that's occurring, um, the particle can effectively sediment out. Um, in combination or separately, we can have flocculation. So we have particles and they're, um, they're coming to a kind of close together. They're encountering each other more, they're more likely to encounter each other because they're um, coming into these small pore spaces. So you're giving particles a lot of opportunities to stick together and to have that gentle mixing as the water is flowing through. And as they flocculate, they can become a larger particle, which then, and yet other particles that come by can also stick to them and it can kind of form this aggregate inside that is uh, not going to, you know, it's going to be uh, stuck there. Another thing you could say is interception or impaction. These two processes are kind of the adsorption. So the difference between adsorption with a D and absorption with a B, these are actually different. The add is adding to the surface. So when we talk about adsorption processes, we're talking about particles or chemicals that are physically sticking onto the surface, and maybe it's a very porous surface, surface so the activated carbon is a good example, but you tend to have lots of pores in a very high surface area per volume. And so anything sticking onto the surface, that's an adsorption process. Absorption, this is like your sponge sucking up water into the sponge material itself. Think of this as abduction. Um, so if you are abducting something or someone, you are taking it within, right? It's like an alien abduction. It happens when you take the person and you pull it all the way inside the spaceship, right? So the abduction, there's a, a sm small difference there. And this is not actually used very often with um, treatment processes because it's requiring that um, bringing it within. Okay, the differences between interception and impaction, um, you know, that, that's a good question. I think that interception, what they're talking about is as they're moving along, um, they are 
encountering the edges of a particle and calling that interception and it's kind of caught along the way. Impaction is when, you know, we talk, it's very similar to sedimentation. So impaction would simply be the same concept of um, sedimentation, except it can happen in any direction, right? So if, if water is flowing through granular media in some snake-like manner, and at some bend, we have this point where the particle is moving that way, and then suddenly the direction changes, the particle makes impact that, that grain um, because the particle didn't turn as fast as the fluid turned. So impaction is that process where um, it looks the same as sedimentation if it's heading downwards, um, but it could be in any direction. And it's just because the water is moving, um, moving and turning faster than the, the particle would. Um, but all of this is just simply to say that there's lots of different mechanisms where particles can end up sticking on the surface um, of the, the granular media. So the, the process by which the granular media removes the contamination or the particles, um, it's physical and there's several ways. It does depend a little bit on, um, and the, sorry, I just realized I was writing behind there. Um, it does depend a little bit on um, the stability of the particles. So if we destabilize the particles with uh, coagulant dosing, then these processes we expect to be more effective. Okay. So what does it look like in practice? Um, here we have the, uh, the system that I was mentioning in, in my lab. This was uh, donated to us. It, we have three columns here, and each column has packed media up to about here. So there's um, probably a meter to a meter and a half of packed media um, in these, and then we can push water through them um, using, using this manifold. Um, and the three units have three different, or three different ratios of media. So here they have this special green sand plus stuff and then anthracite, which is kind of like activated carbon. Um, and so one of them has a ratio where one third is one stuff with two thirds the other. This one in the middle is one half and one half and so on. So we don't, we haven't actually used it for much, but they've designed it um, that way to be kind of a cool um, and useful demonstration tool. Uh, right now, all we have it hooked up to is the tap water. So we can clean the tap water further, but that's you know, not really doing a lot. Um, specifically, this is designed to do pretty well for iron and arsenic removal. <clears throat> um, so they, they make these types of plants, but a little bigger for um, iron and arsenic removal. Uh, you might see a series of tanks like these if you ever visit uh, some sort of a treatment facility. And, you know, these could be anything in here. They could be other types of tanks, but these ones look to me like they're probably uh, packed beds, um, could very, very well be these types of things. Now, these ones, these are all column-based ones that I'm showing you now. Most of what we're gonna focus on is actually more open beds, and we'll have plenty of examples to look at for those. but. What I want to show here is you can do it either way. The point is still that you have a lot of media packed in here and water flowing through it. And in this case, it probably are doing all of these in parallel. See this large uh, manifold here is probably supplying to each of them. Although I suppose you could do one after the other, but that, that doesn't really make sense um, for this type. It makes sense to do two or three with a carbon-based system if you're trying to capture a, a pollutant like benzene and you're using activated carbon, then it, it actually does make sense to use a couple of them because at some point you'll have breakthrough and then your second one will catch the breakthrough and then you have time to clean the first one 
and then swap positions. Um, so that's common if you're doing something more than just the granular filtration, um, if you're doing some absorption process. The, the processes are set up similarly, but we're going to focus here just on the, the granular filtration for um, particle type removal. Um, so in any case, you can have gravity doing it, or you can pressurize it like you see in these pictures where you are applying some pressure and using the pressure to push your water through the media. Okay, for, um, for a granular filtration bed, you see on the bottom left here, there's some guy helping to take all this filter media, this is a, probably a, a couple cubic meters of media here being lowered in with some sort of a crane um, into this bed. And you see the scale of this bed. Um, we're only seeing just a corner of it, and we see it's a very large bed here. Um, these troughs are going to be used for um, handling the backwash and for distributing water onto the beds. Uh, we'll see that in action when I show you a video about it. Um, and essentially what's going to happen is they're going to do, like my aquarium, they're going to layer some pebbles at the bottom with some sort of great material. Um, and then on top of that, they're going to put the finer sand grain um, pieces here uh, supported and held up by these larger grains. And that's going to be essentially the basis of their system. Now, one thing that's pretty cool here, you, you might think to yourself, okay, well, if you have different layers, and especially because sometimes we'll, we'll mix it up. We'll have a layer of sand and then a layer of anthracite or activated carbon. Um, and I'll go ahead and write that. Sometimes we alternate layers. So we'll say like one half sand and then one half um, anthracite. The, the neat thing about this is it will actually self-sort when we backwash, because when we backwash, we're pushing up so much water backwards through, through the media to get rid of all the dirt and grime that we've collected. Um, and if these have slightly different density, then the, the denser ones will sort and be at the bottom, and the lighter ones will be at the top and then they'll, they'll come back into nice even layers um, like we designed the system. So that's kind of a, a neat uh, self-sorting process that can happen. Okay, here's some more, uh, another photo of um, these uh, granular filtration beds. And here, you know, it, it's not quite clear to me from this picture, but it looks, I think they are, arranged this way, where this is one bed, just with a lot of space here, um, and kind of catwalks above it, and then the next bed is over here. And so you're going to have multiple beds here, and you, the one of the reasons of having multiple beds is because you do eventually need to backwash. And when you backwash, you can't operate that filter. You need to provide a continuous filtration in order to provide continuous water for uh, whoever you are uh, supplying your water to, um, which is, you know, sounds obvious when I say that, but since we have those two conditions, right, we need continuous production and we need to stop production sometimes. That gives us a, a little bit of a dilemma and it causes us to, to make more beds than we need at any given time. So we need if we need production continuously from five beds worth of filters, then maybe we need to design for seven or eight so that at any given time we can have some of them offline for cleaning and maintenance. So that process of taking filters down offline in order to do some cleaning, that becomes really important because um, we need to make sure that we can um, 
we can afford the amount of water not being produced during that time. So that's what our math is actually going to focus on is understanding exactly how much water do we need um, and how to get that much given the design parameters of our system. Okay, quick little bit of history here. Um, so the media that we use can be sand, anthracite, granular, granulated, gran excuse me, granular activated carbon, um, or some variant, some specialty type of thing. Um, I mentioned the filters in my lab are loaded with what, what is called green sand plus. It's like a sand coated with manganese, um, a manganese coating. The, really the first time that granular media was used for filtration was back in the 1800s. And we would call these slow sand filters. Essentially, these were acting a lot like my aquarium filter in that they provided lots of surface area for biological treatment. Um, so not only were you getting, you know, back then you, don't, you didn't really have pumps and the equipment to pressurize systems or to handle large flows like we do now, um, or the knowledge about, about these things. So essentially doing it in that slow manner gave some filtration. We had some removal of particles and we had some biological treatment. So it, it's as if you're using groundwater So I'm going to say groundwater-like treatment because water in the ground is generally a little bit safer to drink because there's nothing, you know, if you go deep enough, there's really nothing adding pathogenic microbes. There's plenty of microbes down there, but there's nothing that's related to some animal gut or something that, um, you know, relates, engages with, uh, humans or mammals or anything like that. And instead, the microbiome is outcompeted by whatever microbes can uh, make use of the soil and digest stuff that just happens to be in the water or the, the minerals, stuff like that. So the, the microbial um, composition down in the ground consists of stuff that's not relating to humans. And it's providing that the pores in the ground, it's providing some filtration because the water is passing through all the porous material. So a slow sand filter does both of those things as well. We may have some bio biology happening and hopefully out competing um, any pathogenic stuff. But it's not a big guarantee, especially if it's uh, exposed to surface water and has more potential contaminations. But at least you get some some removal of particles. So that's kind of the, the first use. Um, it's biological in nature in, in some sense, because, you know, like with the, the fish tank, we've got lots of bacteria coating the pebbles, coating the sand, and those bacteria are eating whatever organic matter is in, in the water. So in my case, the bacteria are consuming the fish waste, whatever the plants don't eat, and providing a conversion from ammonia to nitrite to nitrate, which um, helps convert the, you know, the simple waste products into non-toxic or less toxic um, forms by, by uh, doing that decomposition. Okay, so a few terms about um, our filtration system. Um, and by the way, more recently, so certainly in the 1900s, we started um, making making use of what we call our modern rapid or sand filtration designs. Um, I'm not sure really when we started doing that, but we've been doing it for quite some time. And it's a like sedimentation. It's a robust, straightforward way to treat our water. It's um, as you see, it's very helpful and um, used quite quite often. Okay, so a few terms, filter ripening, that's the early operation, first 20 minutes, 15 minutes, um, where we're warming up the system. That's like flushing your Brita filter before you, 
using it because there might be some particles that come out and you don't want to drink that. Um, and it looks nasty. So same thing happens with a fresh filter. Even if we've just cleaned it, it needs some time for the particles to settle back into place. Maybe there's some particles that didn't get removed, some contamination that didn't get removed when we backwashed, and it's still sort of stuck in the matrix. We want to let that flush out and come out of the system before we start producing clean water um, because it's not quite clean enough yet. Backwashing, um, pretty straightforward here. It's the process of flushing water backwards or in reverse uh, through the filter to help clean it and regenerate it. Sometimes we add air um, and do an air purge that helps dislodge more particles than would otherwise have fallen off. Um, pretty straightforward and we're going to look, watch an example of that. Head loss is the next term. This is a term that describes how much loss of pressure. Um, we, we can also describe pressure as head, hydraulic head, meaning the amount of water up on top of the, the media bed. So that water is providing some downward pressure um, causing, causing the water to be pushed through our filter. And so when we look at how much, um, how much pressure we had or how much distance height of, of water was on top of the filter, and then look at the pressure after the filter, we can look at essentially that pressure drop um, or um, that delta P, right? How much pressure was required to force it across the, the media bed. Um, as it gets dirtier and dirtier, that head loss will increase and we will have um, more pressure required. You know, in, in the case of a pressurized column system, we have to add, apply more pressure to get the same flow. In the case of a, uh, a media bed, usually we're just putting a constant flow of water and then the water will slowly build up higher and higher um, in order to match that flow going through it. So it will naturally accumulate a little bit more water, which increases the pressure, which increases the flow through it. And we can do that within some reason, but if we have too much pressure, we could cause the media to split and channelize and create a space where water is just going to flow through without going through the media um, if we apply too much pressure. And so we don't, we want to make sure that our pressure drop is within some reasonable range. Okay, the last term we need to know about is turbidity. Um, I may have mentioned this early in the semester, but turbidity is a, um, a measurement of how dirty or how um, cloudy the water is. If I were to take um, my aquarium scrubber brush and scrape the algae off the sides of my, my aquarium, which is starting to get a little dirty around the edges, um, what you'd see is lots of algae and other particles floating around in the water, and then it'd be harder to see through it. You couldn't see quite as far through it. It's essentially like muddy water, anything diffracting light. Um, so we measure this typically with looking at how much light is scattered, how far can we see through the light, and there's a, a measurement um, metric called NTUs, or nephilometric turbidity units, and this is used um, uh, just kind of as an example of, or as a uh, standard um, metric for turbidity. Um, example here would be uh, you know, low turbidity versus high turbidity. This is different than if you were to just have different strength of T. You know, if you were to make uh, iced tea that, you know, was brown in color, it might be the same color as this murky high turbidity water but unless you broke open the tea bag and let all the leaves out, then it should be clear, right? It should be clear but colored, and there, that's different than um, turbid. So turbidity means you cannot see through this glass, whereas you can see through um, this first one, and you can see mostly through that second one. Um, maybe you can only see a few millimeters or inches through through these other ones. One way to measure it, especially if you're out in a lake, for example, is to use what, what you call a, a secchi disc. 
and you take the this and you drop it down into the water and see at what point can you no longer really distinguish um, the edges between the black and white markings. Um, so it's just a, a fairly simple optical test. Um, and then you measure the distance of rope you had into the water uh, to see at, at what point are you no longer really able to resolve um, the object visually. And so if you have very murky water, it won't take long. Whereas if you have a clean water, you will be able to drop that pretty far. Just another picture, somebody doing that in practice. Okay, so given all that, how do we know when we need to backwash? That's kind of the most important um, design criteria is understanding how often we need to backwash because that's going to tell us how much water can we produce with a, a given filter before we have to take it offline and um, run the cleaning process. So we have three different ways of making that determination. Uh, first would be a head loss limit. So again, this is the pressure. Um, at what point do we have too much pressure and it's no longer safe to operate our, our filter um, because we're going to risk having some channelation? Or maybe the water is just too high and our, our bed wasn't designed to hold that much water. Um, we can reach a head loss limit um, and it becomes an issue for one or both of those reasons. So that's, that's one thing. As soon as we reach a certain um, pressure drop across the filter, we may need to go ahead and take it down and clean it. We could also set a time limit. This is somewhat arbitrary, but operators would often know based on their, their um, their experience with the filter that, hey, this filter usually does really good for 48 hours unless it rains, and then in which case maybe we take it down sooner. So factors like rain and um, changes in the, the upstream quality of water, you know, for rain for a, a surface surface water treatment, um, you know, groundwater would probably not, not vary quite so much. Um, you know, maybe they would need to change the time limit for something like that. Um, but sometimes they can get away with just a, a constant time limit uh, for this, this process. Uh, turbidity limit is another one. And realistically, you usually have a combination of number three, the turbidity limit. So uh, uh, as soon as you hit too much turbidity, you shut the process off and you clean it. Um, that's kind of a, a safety type factor, right? You, you want to make sure that your water does not have too many particles in it. Part of the reason that you really want to remove all the particles as best you can is because the, the next processes, even if a clay particle poses no harm to me, and I might not even know it if I drink a few, um, what can happen is a clay particle or some other particle can potentially hide and protect the viruses and bacteria. So even if it's not inherently a bad thing, we, we really do care about having relatively clean water in terms of particles so that um, it doesn't interrupt or interfere with the next uh, treatment processes. Okay, so typically we're doing a head loss or time limit combined with turbidity monitoring. So if we ever spike above some turbidity, we know, hey, this filter is not working well enough or it's, it's reached its um, limit in terms of how you know how long we can operate it, we need to take it down and clean. So what that would look like if we were to take a a look at the cycle time, um, if we looked at the turbidity over time, and I'm going to start right here at time zero. This is a clean membrane, a clean uh, filter. Over here at the end, we're going to have. Um, I'll just mark it like this. So this is when it was cleaned, and this, I'll say, um, we're going to say it is, I'm going to give a little space for the backwash. So we're going to say stop here, and then 
the total cycle will end after we backwash. So we stop the production. Here is backwash. So during that space in, in there is backwash. Most of the time is production. I'm going to draw this up a little more clearly on, a, on one of the slides coming up, but I wanted to go ahead and label all these to give you an idea of what's going on. Um, and by the way, this backwash, this is probably more like 20 minutes or something. So on an hour time scale, that's not quite to scale. Likewise, here we have the ripening or the um, rinse. And then right here, we have the production start. So for one complete cycle, we have, we first have a, a clean filter, then we rinse it for a little while, then we start producing water, then we stop producing water and clean the filter. Then the cycle is complete and we, we do it over again. Okay, so the cycle then is um, more complicated than just production. It's a little bit like a work week, right? You have five days where you are producing, working, whatever, then you have a weekend, you take care of some, you know, personal and household maintenance or whatever, and then you start again, right? So you think of it that way, where you have um, a bit on both sides where you're not producing, in the middle you're producing, and then um, <clears throat> and then you continue. Uh, good question there. How, on average, how often does a granular media need to be replaced as opposed to just backwashing? You know. It, it depends a little bit, and sometimes it's almost indefinitely. Um, if you have just simply sand, for example, you're not really going to be permanently affecting the sand in any manner, unless maybe you have some escape during backwashing or something or filtration. Maybe you're losing a little bit of mass that you need to replace. Um, if you're dealing with something that's more like uh, activated carbon, activated carbon has to be either replaced or recharged with um, <clears throat> by kind of heat treatment or something similar, depending on what, what contamination you're removing with it that's doing the absorption. Because if it's an absorption process that is important um, in terms of like a chemical absorption, then you have to replace it every so often. Um, and that will depend on the application. If you're treating like really nasty um, like oil spill, contaminated groundwater with activated carbon. Again, that's, that is a different system, but it's related. If that's the case, you might, um, you might uh, end up having breakthrough after one day of operation if it's really dirty and you don't have a huge system and you're cycling that through really rapidly. In terms of drinking water, usually we don't replace the media almost ever. Um, so it's, it's a process that, um, even though it's a lot of media up front, it's um, really high value in terms of reusability. <laughs> okay, so uh, great question there, thank you. Um, regarding the turbidity, what I wanted to show you, <clears throat> if we look at how much, how many particles are in the water after the filter, over time, what it will look like is we'll have, first of all, let's, let's imagine we have some limit. If we go above the limit, then um, we are in danger and that's not, you know, not good and we have to stop, right? So this would be our, our limit here. We have to stop and, uh, remove it, remove it from filtration. So when we're rinsing, typically we are actually above the limit briefly. And then as we rinse out all the junk, it rapidly comes down. Um, and I'm actually going to redraw that a little bit because usually I'm talking about kind of minutes here. And then once we start the cycle, then I'm kind of like onto hours. So typically it's going to look something like this, where we have increasing turbidity over time. And then boom, once we hit that limit, we have to stop. And that's why we stop there. And then you know, we're not really measuring the turbidity during the backwash because we don't have flow coming through. So it's going to look something like that, where 
uh, as soon as we start the actual production, um, we are we should be in a good range, and then we have pretty steady, steady treatment, and eventually it's kind of increasing a little bit. So we can take a look at um, the same process for head loss. Um, for the is that linear? Not necessarily. Um, for the turbidity, it might just be that um, we have really good removal for some time, and then and then it sort of ramps up. Um, you know, it, it's going to be not too far from linear, I think. Um, it's not going to be incredibly sudden, um, but it, it's, I don't think that the principles at play are guaranteeing that it's linear. Now, head loss, on the other hand, if we do the same thing where we have um, kind of our, our key points here, head loss will be linear because as it's, as it's fouling and we have some you know, some head loss limitation here. Um, this one should be a lot more linear where we just cleaned the membrane or the, the filter and we start off and then as it's going, we reach some that head loss limit and we say, okay, let's stop it there. And we can imagine that I do that linearly accounting for like the, the minutes to, to hours conversion here and all that. Um, so head loss should be approximately linear, whereas the turbidity might, it might be that it performs really well, and in fact, it might increase in performance over the first few hours um, as, as it accumulates some, um, some particles, it might actually get better and better, and then it starts coming back up. So the turbidity is a little bit more variable. Head loss should be approximately linear, and so you can kind of predict when it when it's going to be done um, based on that rate at which it's changing. And that's going to depend a little bit on the quality of your water. If your quality of water changes um, somewhat, we expect that might change as well. Okay, so I wanted to, to draw again the cycle a little more clearly with a little more space. So typically what's going to happen is you have production. and you're producing usable clean water. And then you're gonna have at some point, and we'll say this is anywhere from 24 to 96 hours, just depends on the system. Then we have, um, we stop for cleaning. And here, what we're gonna say is sometimes we have an air purge. say air purge, backwash. Let's say that's five minutes. And this is an example, right? If, you know, in a problem, you, you might be given eight minutes for an air purge or whatever. Um, backwash may be 15 minutes. And at the beginning of the cycle, we'll have a rinse that is, um, you know, maybe another 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, we produced all this clean water and here in the backwash, so no water is used here, so no water there for the air purge, but for the backwash, we use clean water and we're making dirty water. Right? So we actually have to send the, that water to a waste treatment. Um, sometimes the water treatment facility will have a small scale wastewater treatment plant, or maybe it'll send it down to the sewer system for the municipal wastewater treatment plant to deal with their wastewater that they're producing while they're producing clean water. So it's kind of interesting, but you actually have drinking water treatment producing wastewater um, in processes like these. Now the rinsing, we also need to do this with clean water. So we're using clean water. And we're producing slightly dirty water. 
water that we're not comfortable sending down the, the treatment. Um, so again, more wastewater to, de to deal with, and we're consuming some of the clean water that we produced, right? So when we balance this in terms of how much water is a filter actually producing over some cycle time, um, which we, we need to know that in order to understand how many filters we need, right? That's at the end of the day, we need to know how many filters we need and how big do they need to be. So we have to factor in how much water we are requiring to take from the clean water we produced in order to run these operations. Now, usually they'll be pretty effective, something like 97%. Um, okay, so is there a monetary benefit from treating your own wastewater in that case? Yeah, there can be. Um, yeah, so it, it, it really does it really does depend. If the municipal treatment, in order to discharge into a municipal wastewater treatment at a large scale, there's gonna be a cost involved. You're gonna to have to essentially have some sort of agreement and then you're gonna pay by the, the gallon, by the um, cubic meter. You're gonna be paying for that. Um, since you have water treatment experts and operators on site it, and you're, you're doing an engineering build out anyway, it might make sense to go ahead and um, set up a small, um, small treatment system where you can um, conduct just relatively simple small scale processes for your specific treatment train and get a permit for that. Since you already have all those expertise um, and equipment and, and design and everything, you're already dealing with that type of stuff, it might make sense to go ahead and do it in-house um, for long-term um, costs. Yeah, but it, it really does depend. And you know, maybe maybe you can send it through a wastewater, one wastewater process and then discharge it into groundwater and that's cheap. You know, it, it really that's gonna depend and I think I think it goes both ways in practice. Okay, so before before I leave off here, I want to show you a couple videos. Just to kind of give you a kind of a more visual and audio experience of what this is going to look like in practice. So I've got a couple of YouTube videos uh, to pull up here. Um, both of these are um, a little bit lengthy. I'm going to uh, I'm going to let I'm going to just do a little bit of talking here, but mostly let you listen to the audio. Um, let me know if the audio is too loud. I've got to turn it down a little bit. I recommend you get ready to turn it down. At one point, they do the air purge, and it's um, particularly loud. Um, so I will. I'm going to go ahead and adjust this down even a little further. <clears throat> so just be ready with your um, volume, um, and I'll skip ahead through the different parts um, and talk you through them a little bit. So this is what the group of people at this uh, treatment plant we have. We uh, just started putting air in the back up to this filter head and see how great that looks. That's the uh, uncomfortable part. We are priming the air pipe. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Oops, so. um, and then once they primed the, the air out of the pumps and got all the water into the pumps, um, still doing it. Then they're finally ready uh, to put water back with fuel. 
Okay, so then they're starting to pump water back through. That pump is finally all the way prime. And they're now pushing water up through the filters. And over the next couple of minutes, you see some more air getting kind of pushed up, up and out through the, the media bites, but mostly that water displacing all the air. Film the water for a bit. It's all. So now we can kind of see, see the water level rising, and then let's get forward, let's get and we we'll see here. Let's go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Here's the natural water. I think somebody in the, the video makes a joke about that, how would you? So that's, you know, that one cycle is worth of particles and dirty water that's coming up out and, you know, got stuck in the media beds and is now coming out. And you see that's the reason we have these little clocks um, to allow that media allow that water to come out and to be channeled into this larger channel and sending it out to um, the street. Normally you, you would uh, once once you clean all this out, then you can send in water that's going to be treated into this uh, trough. It will overtop the smaller trough and add kind of fairly evenly into the bed. So you can use this whole system uh, in either direction. Oh, so that's um you can make as many videos as you want and you never need to pick up a camera that's that one i wanted to um show you one more because it's kind of nice to be able to see what happens um once the once the water has been or once the um the water flowing out is uh cleaned and kind of see that difference in the media so we'll definitely skip through we're not staying here for 18 more minutes to watch this one but um, if we take a look here, we see that, um, you know, the bed itself, you can kind of see it's kind of dirty. There's a little bit of orange here uh, visible um, and that have a similar trough system here. So we're going to play this and we'll skip through. Again, there's not... Not too many exciting noises aside from the uh, treatment plant being open. Um, so I think they just started pushing water through it. Or they're about to. So here you go, you can kind of see change in texture and color right there is pretty impressive as as these particles start to get dislodged and suddenly okay, I think they're doing the air purge first and suddenly it just erupts with all this um, all those particles and nasty junk in there. Okay so that goes on for a little while. Um, that's the air purge again and if you look at the timestamp that's you know nearly five minutes of air purge now and then they start calming it down and then they are get priming their pumps skip that and then they're pushing water and they're doing the um the actual backwash next just gonna do that for a minute so then we have water coming up it's over topping And you can see this is whatever particles that they happen to be treating in their water source. That certainly looks kind of like orange clay. Um, it's probably something that's in their um, in their river water or whatever they're treating. Um, so you may have even some indication of what what water bottle they're treating from. Okay, so we're gonna fast forward a little bit and see kind of how this 
water is changing and see how it's clearing up as more and more of the particles are removed. So you can kind of start to see that there's, there's some cleaner spots where water is that's flowing out is, uh, is looking a little bit cleaner. And you know, it's pretty pretty good volume of water coming out. So it's getting cleaner and cleaner to a point where um, you know, it's, it's getting to be where you can actually see that the, the media underneath is kind of a dark um, you know, blackish color. Um, and then it looks like they've just stopped draining and they've decided, okay, that's, that's uh, enough of the backwash. And then from here, what's going to happen is they're just filling it further and as it fills, this pressure is going to be pushing water downwards through those beds. And then it's, it's going to be doing the rinse phase from there. And as it's doing that, you can kind of, I'm not sure when exactly they turn on the outlet, but essentially that's, that's going to start pulling water through these and whatever particles happen to be suspended anymore are going to get pulled into the filtration beds. Okay, so that's about all I've got for you today. I thought that was um, kind of a little more engaging, hopefully, a little more interesting in terms of um, what's going on with the, uh, the system. Um, I probably can show you the at the bottom of my aquarium, um, my fish has dug out a little spot. I can show you kind of the, the mesh that's used in my aquarium to support um, to support the, the granular media of my aquarium. So I'm going to work on that while I give you a moment if you have any questions, um, and then we'll be uh, we'll be done for today, and we will pick up here and look at the equations of the kind of the mass and water balances um, next time. So I'll see if I can do this. You can kind of get a glance at the aquarium bed. So you can kind of see that a uh, dark black grid material there. Um, that's, let's see if I can change the color. That'll change. That's the material that I'm talking about. Um, and the fish is like, hey, what's up? All right, and with that, that's all I've got for you. So unless there are any questions, we'll talk to you next time. All right, have a good day.